about 40. Very good. You, you pick it up on the sign there, but you just didn't have all of it yet. So how many people, about how many people wrote the Bible? 40 different meanings. That's a bunch of folks. Okay. How long did it take to write the Bible? How many? 1,600 years. Okay. It took how many writers for the ocean? 
Y'all go ahead and hold them all up high real good. Glad to see everybody here tonight. God is good and all the time. Absolutely glad everybody is here. Uh, by the way, y'all did really good, uh, adults. Uh, y'all did really good on the, uh, the song that goes along with the, uh, uh, the books of the New Testament. Uh, y'all did really good. Some of you were cheating. I saw your Bibles turn to the table of contents. <laughs> oh, you had to, I'm just teasing. Y'all did really good. Again, we're glad everybody is here. Uh, hope and pray that you're anticipating a, a great week. Uh, out in the world, uh, out, out in uh, uh, the battlefield, out in our mission field uh, as we go out from this place and uh, uh, are better representatives and ambassadors for Christ than we were uh, last week. Uh, that's the name of the game. We want to improve and be better each and every uh, moment of each and every day. You know, if you think you're uh, too small to make a difference, you ought to try sleeping in a small room with a mosquito. Think about that for a minute. If you've ever uh, tried to sleep somewhere, maybe in uh, uh, Guyana or even at your own house here in Op somewhere, and you got a pesky little mosquito, that little mosquito will keep you up all night long. So don't ever think you're too small to, uh, to make a difference. You may just be one person, but one person can make a huge difference uh, in the world. So don't ever think you're too small to make a difference. Just remember that pesky little mosquito when you're trying to, uh, trying to go to sleep. You know, there's a, a lot of things, a lot of situations, there's a lot of circumstances that all of us face uh, in life that will either make us bitter or better. Those situations can uh, cause us to drift away from God or they can cause us to draw closer to God. That choice is ultimately ours. We've been talking about, last week we started talking about uh, not drifting, uh, not being a driftwood type Christian, just going along with the current and just flowing with the trends of our world that we live in. God doesn't want us to just drift along. Uh, God wants us to, uh, to follow close to him and, and to have a, a particular direction that is in alignment with God's word. James chapter 4, verse number 8, as we kind of continue that, uh, train of thought from last week James chapter 4 verse 8 James tells us draw near to God and he will draw near to you and if we're going to be Christians who refuse to drift we've got to make sure that we are as close to God as we possibly can be we don't want to give the devil an inch we don't want to give him even less than an inch of an opportunity uh, to come between us and God. So we want to draw just as close to God as we possibly can. So when we look at and we live our, our lives, we can do that either in faith or fear. During the pandemic and even since uh, the pandemic has uh, eased up just a touch, we were thinking about the, the idea of living uh, faith over fear and wisdom over worry and prayer over panic. Y'all remember those? Nobody does. Okay, good. All right, so we're going to do that again. Y'all might want to write those down. Some of y'all are nodding because this is not just uh, good stuff during a pandemic. This is good stuff for any day of our lives. Now, let's, let's get those burned in our brains. Faith over fear, wisdom over worry, and prayer over panic. So we've got faith over fear, wisdom over worry, and prayer over panic. And those are important, faith and, and wisdom and prayer, instead of fear and worry or panic. But that's the response we get to choose. You and I have that choice. Are we going to respond in faith or in fear? Are we going to respond and live in, in the wisdom of God? Or are we going to just sit there and, and worry about it? Are we going to pray? Are we going to pray even more? Or are we just going to panic? But we want to live faith over fear, wisdom over worry, and prayer over, over panic. Because life before the pandemic and life after the pandemic... Is all about God. 
It's all about focusing on, on God and, and how we handle and live each day. No matter if we're on the top of the mountain and everything is going great, or we're way down in the valley and life is just terrible. I was reminded this week of a passage in 2 Corinthians 5 as we get started tonight, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 5 in verse 7 tells us that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. Very easy many times for us as we live day after day, step after step in life. As we walk this journey of life, it's very easy for us uh, to live life based on what we can see, what we can, what we can handle or touch. We're very sensory oriented. I mean, we're human. We're physical beings in a physical world. That's the way God has created us. But Paul, inspired of God, tells us we're to walk or live by faith and not by sight. Paul told young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, he, he told young Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I'm working on a lesson to, to really get into that because that's a powerful uh, verse. God has not given us a spirit, a mindset, or an attitude of, of fear. But he says rather of, of power, God's power, of, of love, God's love, and a sound, healthy mind. No doubt patterned after the, the very mind of Christ. But tonight I want you to ask yourself a question. Whose news do you listen to? Whose news do you listen to? We all listen to the news, I'm sure, to some degree or another. Maybe it's Fox or ABC or NBC or whatever uh, the news outlet uh, may be. Whose news do you listen to? The news of the world or the news of God? God's news never changes. The news of the world, it changes literally moment by moment by moment by moment. It's, it's always, always changing. And there's a lot of times in this life when it looks hopeless, right? You look at the situation that you're facing and you see there's, there's no way out. There's no, no logical explanation. There's just no way that it's going to work out. Life is just all hopeless. But tonight, God's good news is that there is a lot more to this life than what you can see and what we will experience in this life. There's more to life than the here uh, and, and the now. This, this life is important, but this life is not all that there, there is. But how we live this life determines where we spend eternity. So we want to live every day, every moment, with our eyes on that eternal prize, living every day in view of eternity, with our eyes on heaven and our eyes and our heart on Jesus. We sang several songs tonight about hope. About hope. Tonight, our, our focus is going to be on our hope that's in Christ Jesus. The only hope that we have in this life for eternity. It is not in this world. If you're, if you're banking all your hope on things of this world, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in the government. Our hope is not in anything of this world. Take a moment and go in your Bibles. To, we're going to start tonight in John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Jesus told his disciples in John 16 verse 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In the world, he said, you're going to have tribulation and trials and problems and all of those things. But he said, in me, you, you will have, have peace. Be of good cheer. He said, I have overcome the world. So Jesus Christ is our only and true hope. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 Paul said that Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you. You 
You see, this hope that we're talking about tonight, the hope that we find only in Christ Jesus is the very anchor of our souls. We sang about it just a moment ago. And that anchor is both sure and steadfast. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6, please. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 19. This was the verse that I asked, encouraged you to read earlier today. Only one verse. I'm sure, I'm sure if I asked you to raise your hand, someone, someone read it. Maybe you pulled it up on your iPhone. Maybe you pulled it up from your brain because you got Hebrews 6, 19 memorized. But here in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19, the Scripture says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast and which enters the presence behind the veil our anchor we have an anchor of the soul recently went fishing with brother Dennis and we have two anchors he has two anchors for his boat he's got a 10 pound anchor and he's got a set of 15 pound anchors depends on the uh, speed of the wind and what it's going to be he'll bring either one and you know what Sometimes those anchors work really, really good to keep us in place right there off the bank where we're trying to fish. But sometimes the wind is so strong, guess what the wind does? It blows us with anchors and all cattywonkest. I mean, it will just blow us all over the pond. Doesn't it really matter where we're going or what we're trying to do. That wind sometimes will blow us. But here in Hebrews 6 and verse 19, this hope, he says, we have as an anchor of the soul. And it is, he says, steadfast and sure. With this hope, we're not going to be blown all over the place. We're going to be able to be anchored and be secure. Way back in 1874... Not very many people in the room were around in 1874. There's a couple of you that were. But a young lady by the name of Priscilla Owens wrote a song that we just sang a moment ago. It's entitled, We Have an Anchor. The chorus of that song says, We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. And you know what? The billows are going to roll. Those sea waves are just going to just roll and roll and roll they never cease and so she she says that we are fastened to the rock which cannot move grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love and you know who that spiritual rock is that we are grounded to that we are fastened to Paul says in 1st Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 that our spiritual rock is Jesus Christ he is our firm foundation. He is what we are anchored to. He is our hope. Without him, we have nothing. Without him, we are nothing. In Psalm 71, verse 5. Psalm 71 and verse 5 says, You are my hope, O Lord God. No doubt about it. No, no issues there. You, O oh Lord, are my hope. There's a lot of things and people that we place our hope, our confidence, our trust in. But we need to remove all of those and, and put all of our faith and our hope and our trust in God. And no matter what the sea billows may be, no matter what the storms of life may be, no matter how fierce those winds blow, and they can blow kind of hard sometimes in life. When we have our, our hope in God, it doesn't really matter what happens to us in life. God's still in charge. God's still in control. And he is working it all for our eternal good. Does that make it any easier to endure the storms? Maybe in some ways, yes. To know that he is there with us. And he can either calm the storm or he can calm us as his child in the storm. There's another great song in our book. It's called Master the Tempest 
is raging. What a gorgeous song. That we can find peace and be it calm even when the storms of life just rage around us. And so we need that constant reminder every moment of every day that this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels, they beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. That's a great song. Maybe that'll be a song that sticks in your head for the rest of the week. I hope it is. I hope you're whistling that song. I hope you're, you're singing that song out loud to remind yourself, hey, there's more to life than this. I'm living for heaven. I'm living for eternity. But why is it important when we think about our hope uh, that's uh, grounded firm and deep in the Lord Jesus Christ himself, why is it so important that we remember that this world is not our home? Go to what Jesus said. Go with me, if you will, please, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter uh, number 6. Sometimes we get just too attached to the world. But we need to remember that we're just pilgrims and strangers. We're not home yet. And I hope you're homesick. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now here's why all of that is so important. Verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's your treasure? If it's here in this world, in this life, moth and rust can destroy it. Thieves can break in and steal. It's not going to last but when our treasure is in heaven and we're storing up those treasures in heaven, we're living for something bigger than ourselves. We're living for something that's going to last throughout eternity. Therefore, what do we need to do? In the words of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, we need to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us or traps us. And he says that we need to run with endurance or patience the race that is set before us. I was watching a couple of uh, indoor track and field uh, relay races on uh, YouTube recently. And it was entitled Epic Comebacks. It was these four by four relay races. And you know, you understand the, the anchor leg is the fourth person running. It's the, the last leg of this race. And there was this one guy running that anchor leg, and he was a good 40 yards behind the next person. And I don't have to really tell you what happens. You know what happened. I'm not sure what they did to him, but he took off like he was on fire. And he literally walked this other runner down and he passed him with about 50 yards left in his leg of this race for an epic comeback he ran his race he knew exactly what he had to do and he wasn't worried about anybody behind him he had one goal I'm gonna catch that guy in front of me and y'all you should have seen it that guy that was running along he thought he had it man he was just a cruising and that other guy caught him and just went flying right on by. It was really, really neat to watch. But he says we need to run with endurance, the patience, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. There's a lot of things in life that can distract us. But remember, you are a runner in a race. And it's not a sprint, it is a marathon. So we got to have endurance and patience and spiritual stamina to endure and cross the finish line. And the very cables, I believe, that, that hold us or fasten us to uh, the rock, our hope in Christ, are those cables of faith. Faith. 
That's why we constantly need to be reading and studying and, and meditating on God's Word. Because where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17. You know what Romans 10, 17 says. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We need to get God's Word in our mind and let it go down into our hearts so that our, our faith is strengthened. How effective would a workout uh, be if you only worked out one day a week for about an hour? Eh, not very. What about our spiritual exercise? Do we just exercise on Sunday morning for about an hour and then that's it? I hope not. I hope we're exercising spiritually every day. That we're working out those spiritual muscles every single day. In Hebrews chapter 11, you know that great hall of fame of faith chapter. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so we don't want to just exercise our faith on one day for about an hour. We want to exercise our faith and strengthen our faith every single day. Because as we strengthen our faith, not only are we strengthening our faith, guess what? We're also drawing closer to God. We're also building on, on the solid rock of our foundation, who is Christ himself. If you will, go in your Bibles to uh, Matthew, since we're in Matthew chapter 6, look with me at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. Je Jesus kind of wraps all of it up and he talks about a wise and a foolish builder. We know the, we know the story that Jesus gives here. He knows, you know, we know what Jesus is talking about. There's a wise builder, there is a foolish builder. Now, why is the wise builder wise? What, what distinguished him from the foolish builder? Do you remember? The, the wise builder heard these sayings of Jesus, and he did them. He obeyed. He put them into practice. What, what about the foolish builder? You can probably figure it out now. The foolish builder heard the sayings of Jesus just like the wise man did. But the foolish man, hearing them, he did not do them. He did not obey. He did not put them into practice. All right, so the, the wise man heard and did, building on a solid foundation of rock, Jesus said. He was a wise builder. After all, if you're not building on a solid rock foundation, you don't really have a good foundation to be building on. And the foolish man learned that the hard way. He's building on a foundation of sand. How good is that? You ever built a sand castle and had a little bit of the water come up from the wave and it just, it just tears it up and destroys it? But listen to what Jesus said happens here. Because both of these men, they heard, one of them did, the other one did not do. But they both went through a storm. And listen to what happens. Verse 25, the uh, rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. That's the house of the, of, the, of the wise builder here. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. We've been singing a little bit about that. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine, Jesus said, verse 26, and does not do them, he says, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Now here comes the same storm. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. But Jesus makes a point here to say, and great was its fall. I mean, it was a total devastating crash of a fall. That's the difference. It's the foundation they built on. And the foundation, Jesus said, is hearing these sayings of mine and, and doing them. Reading and learning and obeying God's word. Building on the solid rock of, of Jesus himself. Notice the wise man. He was not exempt from the storm, was he? 
he still went through that storm. The same floods and rains and winds that, that beat on the foolish man's house are the very ones that beat on his, and, and his house stood. Psalm 27, verse 1. Psalm 27, verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I be afraid? Whom shall I fear? He says, The, the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light, He's my salvation, and He is my strength. Who should I be afraid of? What should I be afraid of? If he is your light in the darkness, if he is our salvation, our deliverer, if he is the very strength of our life, who can stand against us? Who should we be afraid of? You see, this life is a, a battleground. And we are soldiers. We are soldiers of Christ. He is the captain of our salvation. And he's given us marching orders. We're going to sing the song in a little bit. Soldiers of Christ, arise. And he says, and put your armor on. Paul says in Ephesians 6, to put on the whole armor of God. We want to be fully dressed in every piece of the armor that God has equipped us with. Put on the armor of God. He tells us to be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might. Why? Because then and only then are we more than conquerors through him who loved us. Romans 8 and verse 37. What was the statement from this morning that you're supposed to remember and burn in your brain? Remember? God won't let you down. God won't let you down. God won't let you down. He won't leave you. Leave you. He won't forsake you. He won't abandon you. He will always be there with us and, and for us. So there's really no reason for us to, to drift away. But we do. But we do. We do often drift away. So what do we need to do? We need to check our anchor. Our, the cables that have securely fastened us to the rock maybe our faith isn't as strong as it ought to be and we're drifting maybe we've taken our eyes off of Jesus and we've wandered away then again we may not be fully dressed for battle we may not have on the full armor of God we might be dressed to the T with every piece of that armor but we're just simply not doing what soldiers do and what do soldiers do what are soldiers trained to do one thing fight and follow orders they're following orders to fight to go out and do what they've been trained and equipped to do fight maybe we're on the battlefield but we're just simply not fighting the good fight of faith we're just standing back sitting back watching everyone else maybe fighting that battle I want to challenge us not to give up. Don't, don't throw in the towel. Don't, don't surrender. Keep your eye on that heavenly prize. Keep your eye on Jesus. Realize you're not in, in this battle all by yourself. You got fellow soldiers. The captain of our salvation has made that victory ours. So we don't have to drift. We don't have to be driftwood. We can be that soldier. We can be that runner in the race that's getting ready to cross that finish line faithfully. I want to give you kind of a, a sample taste of what I want us to cover and look at next week. Lord willing, I hate to give you homework, but it'll give you something to, to really think about and chew on, and you've got a whole week to do it. I want you to read, if you will, from 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 3 through 9. Go ahead and write it down. Don't forget, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through about verse 9. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You got them? Can I give them to you again? You need them? Because that's what we're going to look at. 
the good Lord will in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 9 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 because not only is this life a battleground it is also a testing ground and it's either pass or fail I hated those tests in school it was either pass or fail there was no A, B, C you either passed it or you failed it and it's either pass or fail for us and God allows the, the testing of our faith. And that's what Peter's writing about there in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. The, the very testing of our faith. But to know that God also provides a way out. A way of escape in our time of, of trial and, and temptation. So if you will, again, read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And just meditate on those. Chew on those. Think about the very testing of our faith. The testing ground that God has allowed us to be in. So when we leave this building tonight, remember you're going out into your mission field. Life's not going to be fun always. It's not going to be easy. But guess what? You got God on your side. You got fellow Christians right here in this room on your side as well. And it might be tonight that we can encourage you, we can pray with you, we can come alongside you and help you out in some way because we're in this thing together. And we know that God is always there with us. But if we can help in some way, we're going to sing a song to encourage whatever your need may be. Will you come and let us know as we stand together and sing?
give us the strength to recognize the opportunities of this life that you give us to, to spread your love. And we pray, Father, that we would be ready and able to do those things. We pray, dear God, finally, for your, uh, thankful for your son and for uh, his sacrifice for our sins. Forgive us where we failed you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.